Yeah, I'm going to follow up on uh, what Nia was talking about, and uh, I think the very important point is that uh, solar activity is actually very important for changes in climate. And uh, what we have been working on for now many years is actually trying to understand what the connection can be. And uh, it's no surprise that uh, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit uh, about clouds and uh, the link uh, to cosmic rays. Let me give you a uh, sort of overview of what I'm going to talk about. I have two parts. The first is to give you a background uh, of why I think cosmic rays are important uh, and uh, how they uh, link to cloud. We have some experimental evidence, we have observational evidence, and uh, I will talk about what can the uh, link be between ionization in the atmosphere and then uh, the formation of clouds. The last part will actually be on a, a field that uh, was initiated uh, by NIA. Uh, it has to do with changes in climate over millions of years. Uh, it's very interesting because it's a, a completely independent of solar activity. Here you see more or less uh, the idea uh, which NIA also was uh, presenting that uh, we have cosmic rays which are particles that comes from space and they are mainly produced in stellar processes where we have supernovas uh, and they make a shock front and that accelerate particles to uh, you know, very, very high energies. And these particles, they shower in over uh, the, the Earth. And there are two things that can modulate uh, the cosmic rays. One is solar activity. It's on the order of 10%. Uh, and the other, which I'm going to talk about in the last part of the talk is that you can have changes on the order of uh, 100%. Uh, so, when I started this, uh, I knew that people have been finding uh, correlations between solar activity and climate. And uh, the question I asked me was, uh, you know, if, uh, if it's going to work, uh, it might actually be clouds that are affected by uh, cosmic rays. That was sort of the fundamental idea. And when I took or uh, found data, here, here you see data from 83 until 2005. Uh, the blue curve is actually from a satellite data set of low clouds, and you see this uh, nice correlation. Um, the red curve here is the changes in cosmic rays over uh, the same period. So it gave an impression that uh, maybe uh, you know, there's something interesting going on. But of course, this is just a correlation. So there's no uh, guarantee that there is a physical mechanism. And at the time when we presented this, uh, many people were saying that there's no known mechanism. So we actually don't believe that this can be right. It could be some accidental uh, correlation. And I should also say that the changes in cloud cover observed from satellites is very, very difficult. It's very, very difficult to maintain a calibrated system. Uh, so you might end up where uh, the correlation actually breaks down and you cannot be sure what is the cause of it. So there's no guarantee that this is necessarily, you know, a cause, a causality uh, that we have between the two uh, curves. As Nia showed, the effect of solar activity over 11 years is of the order of one to one and a half watt per square meter. So over the 11 years. And the changes I just show you in cloud cover, they are actually of the order uh, that fits within this picture. So it could be that the clouds are the amplifying uh, mechanism that makes uh, solar activity so important uh, in our uh, uh, climate. So the obvious question is, how do cosmic rays affect climate? And the idea is uh, that, I mean, you have to understand how clouds are formed. And in order to, to have a cloud, you need what we call cloud condensation nuclei. These are very small uh, aerosol particles. They have a certain size on the order of 50 to 100 nanometer. And at that size, 
water vapor can condense on them and they can become cloud droplets. The fundamental question is then, how are these small cloud condensation nuclei formed? And it turns out that a large fraction of the cloud condensation nuclei are actually formed directly in the atmosphere from gases. So you have molecules uh, in a gas and then uh, they can stick together and make a small cluster. And this cluster might be stable and uh, you have a small aerosol and then subsequently it grows uh, by condensing more gas uh, and finally it becomes a cloud condensation, or sorry, it becomes a, a cloud droplet. So the idea that we had was that this ionization from cosmic rays that is happening in the atmosphere all the time, it actually promotes the stability and the formation of these small particles. That was the uh, fundamental idea. Now, here you actually see a very good example of uh, what happens if you change the number of aerosols that goes into the uh, atmosphere. Here you have a region uh, over the oceans with uh, low clouds, and these stripes here are actually ship tracks. So what is happening is that a ship from the engine is pumping out a lot of aerosols. These aerosols go into the clouds, and you all of a sudden get condensation of water vapor, but you see that you change the microphysics uh, along the track of the uh, ship, uh, uh, along the track of the uh, ship. And, and the idea is that if you can do this systematically, I mean, if solar activity is capable of changing uh, the number of aerosols or the aerosol properties, it will be a very effective way of changing uh, the radiative uh, properties uh, of the Earth, of clouds, and so on. So, that was uh, the idea, and uh, the initial thing we did was that we could test these things uh, experimentally. Uh, we could test whether small ions actually promote the formation of small aerosols, okay? And uh, this has actually been uh, uh, measured. And I think this is uh, the measurements we did. Uh, this is uh, from 2006 when we uh, uh, first uh, published it. It was, okay, it came out 2007. Nonetheless, what you have on, along this axis is something that corresponds to the ionization or the cosmic rays. And when you increase the cosmic rays, uh, you increase the number of, or the formation of small particles uh, in our uh, experimental uh, chamber. Uh, and in 2011, the cloud project actually uh, came up with the same or similar results showing that uh, when you increase the ionization in a chamber, you are producing small aerosols. So we have a production of uh, aerosols. So that, you can say that was very supportive of the theory, but it is extremely important that these small particles, that they grow to cloud condensation nuclei, and if they don't do that, they will not affect climate. And it turns out that uh, there was a number of groups that put this mechanism into large uh, models, uh, climate models, and tested what happened if they increased the number of small cloud condensation nuclei uh, as, the, you know, uh, as the solar activity changed. So they are sort of testing the idea. And it turns out in all of these simulations, even though they put in extra of these small particles, more or less none of them grow to cloud condensation nuclei. And that was seen as a uh, fundamental problem for the whole uh, idea. Uh, it was said uh, many places that uh, that was the end of this uh, idea. But fortunately, we can also test it uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, la laboratory. So, it, the important thing is that modeling says no to this effect on ions and cloud condensation nuclei. And therefore, there's no link, uh, or it's not important. Uh, but we could actually address it in our uh, laboratory. So what we did was the following. We had a, 
our cloud chamber here, we could shine UV light, which corresponds to uh, the effect of the sun. Uh, and then we can put in various gases. And when we have this light, we are producing small uh, aerosols all the time. Then we can add ionization from these radioactive sources, which is like turning up and down the cosmic rays. And then we can measure uh, what is going on. And let me, this is a, a picture of the uh, chamber. It's about eight cubic meters uh, large. Uh, nothing, I mean, you can see the uh, radioactive sources here and here. Okay, but here you see a, a typical e experiment where we are shining light in on this uh, part of the chamber, producing small aerosols, and they are growing. And we have the size of the particles going up this way, and this is the uh, the number of particles, and they go into a steady state. And then we can sort of add some extra particles by different methods. And then we can see what is the fate of having additional small particles. Will they grow to cloud condensation nuclei? That is the fundamental uh, question. And the first experiment we did was to add neutral particles to our chamber, very small particles on the order of three to five nanometers. And uh, here you see, uh, the result. Here you have the size. This is about 10 nanometers and this is 70 nanometers. At this size, they are cloud condensation nuclei, so they, they are large enough. Uh, and what we do is we increase the number of particles with about 50%. And then you see as they grow, fewer and fewer of them actually makes it to cloud condensation nuclei. So when we add neutral aerosols and we are not using cosmic rays, the result is in complete agreement with the numerical modeling. And the reason is that when we put in more particles, we have more particles competing for the same gas that they have to grow from. And then they grow slower and there's a larger chance that they can get lost by uh, some uh, process. But then look what happens if we do it with uh, cosmic rays. If we add cosmic rays uh, to the uh, chamber, we produce uh, about 15% uh, more small particles, but notice that nearly all of them grow to cloud condensation nuclei. And that is in complete contradiction of all these modeling uh, results. So something is going on uh, which is not in uh, any of the physics uh, of all these models. And this could very well be the reason why uh, this mechanism actually might work in the real world. However, people were telling us that maybe we have a mechanism that works in our laboratory, but if you go out to the real atmosphere, it might not work. Uh, there are so many other processes that are producing cloud condensation nuclei, so therefore uh, it need not to be, uh, uh, you know, important. There are so many other processes, so it will just drown. Um, so what we, um, what we did was to look at what we called, uh, you know, natural experiments uh, that the sun is, uh, you know, providing us uh, we have these coronal mass ejections where you have a large piece of plasma that comes out. Uh, if you imagine the sun here and you have this plasma, if it hits, uh, if the Earth is here, for instance, and it hits the right way, then there is a sudden drop in the cosmic rays. That means that when these, if, when these effects are, are, are happening, uh, we can use it uh, to test whether there is an effect on clouds and other parameters uh, relevant for these ideas. And here you see uh, the result. Um, this is uh, the red curve here is uh, the change in cosmic rays because of these events on the sun. These are the five strongest events over a period of 20 years. Um, what you have here is day zero, that is when we have a minimum in the cosmic rays, and then we have 50, oh, sorry, 20 days after the event and 15 days before. 
And then we look, for instance, at the liquid water that we have in clouds. Uh, this is liquid water in the uh, uh, clouds over the oceans. And you see that there is a distinct drop in the uh, liquid water uh, following the uh, events in the cosmic rays. And this is on the order of 6% change in the liquid water, so it's actually quite large. And it's not just this satellite data set that uh, shows this. We can take other satellite data set which has uh, you know, other uh, temporal, uh, the covered different temporal periods. And still we see uh, these drops uh, following the uh, effect of the cosmic rays. Um, and finally, uh, we also see the effect in the aerosols, uh, suggesting uh, that we are observing more or less the whole chain from solar activity to cosmic rays to aerosols to clouds. So this is a strong support of the idea that there could be such a uh, connection. Okay, so we have a mechanism, and uh, it looks as if it is working in the uh, in the uh, real atmosphere. Uh, what I want to uh, show you now is when we go to the very long time scales. Uh, I just told you that when we look at longer time scales, we can have variations on the order of a hundred percent, which are completely independent from solar activity. And if this mechanism is something that has been operating for, uh, you know, during all times, we would expect or we could hope for to find correlations even on very long time scales, which would be an independent uh, support uh, for, for the idea. Um, now, when we look at these very long time scales, and this is the uh, work of uh, Nia Shariv, that if you imagine that the solar system is moving around, we go in and out of regions where we have these red dots, which is supposed to be a supernova is going off. So at some periods, we are between these uh, spiral arms, and sometimes we are in a spiral arm, and that should give a large change in the amount of uh, cosmic rays during uh, this uh, journey. And I should say that the journey takes about 240 million years just to go around uh, once, so it's quite long. Um, here you see uh, Nias. Uh, here you see Nias' uh, estimate of how the cosmic rays has been varying over this period of time, and this is actually related to uh, various uh, spiral arms. Uh, you see, uh, you see them here, and if you now. Uh, compare it uh, with the work of Jan Weiser. Um, you see where this is supposed to be the, the red curve, the temperature of the oceans, uh, in the tropical oceans, uh, over the last 500 million years. You see this uh, very nice correlation. So that was sort of the start of uh, uh, this uh, uh, you know, independent check that uh, there's also a correlation even on these very long time scales. Now, the support for, for this model, uh, there, there, there are various support. One is that we see something which is similar to 140 million year period in climate. Uh, Nia has also shown that there seems to be 140 million year in iron meteorites, uh, and uh, that actually has to do with exposure to galactic cosmic rays. So this is also in support that uh, you know the uh, interstellar uh, environment is changing over uh, this uh, period. I want to show you the last part here, some of the work that I have done, uh, which has to do with open uh, cluster formation and supernovas. And what I want to do is to try to reconstruct uh, the number of supernovas that went off uh, in the solar neighborhood over the last 500 million years. So to that uh, and I'm going to use what we call open stellar clusters. And there's one open stellar clusters that nearly all pe people know, which is the uh, Pleiades. Uh, it's about 200 million years old. It's about 1,000 stars. Um, and the thing is that these stars, it's a group of stars that are bound by gravity. And they're all formed from some uh, molecular gas cloud that collapses and you make a lot of stars which are born at the same time, all in a, in a group. So here you see 
Uh, this is a sort of a bird's eye view of uh, our Milky Way. This is the uh, solar system. This is about 3,000 light years. Um, and each dot is a open stellar cluster. This is the uh, Pleiades so that is right here. So uh, that is uh, fairly close to our solar system. But what is interesting is that the, the, uh, most of these dots are blue, which means that they are quite, uh, they are quite young. Uh, and I can make an uh, age distribution of all these open clusters, and it looks something like this. So here you see uh, this is present, and this is 500 million years ago. And you see there are many more young clusters. And then as a function of time, as we go further back, we have fewer and fewer clusters. And the question is whether this curve actually says something about the formation of star, I mean star formation in the solar neighborhood. And I want to uh, make the case that it actually uh, do. So the idea is to use this information. Um, I can take the, what, what we call the star formation over this period, it's actually the cluster formation. And then when I produce a number of clusters or stars, then a certain fraction of them will explode as a function of time. Uh, within 40 uh, million years, all of them will be more or less uh, exploded. And if I combine these two things, I get the supernova rate, and that's exactly what I want. So I want to see how did the supernovas change uh, over the last 500 million years. And the supernovas, of course, is a measure for the galactic cosmic rays in the solar neighborhood. Okay? And this is the result. So here you see, a, you can more or less see these uh, uh, wavy form. <coughs> Uh, which has to do our patches uh, through spiral uh, arms. And an obvious question is, of course, whether this is a real curve, I mean, or is it just uh, noise uh, that I have uh, amplified? Is it a real signal? Uh, and we can actually try to estimate it in a different way. Um, first of all, let me just show you that if I take different uh, open cluster catalogs, I get more or less the same result. So it's not really dependent on one particular uh, data set. Um, but I can actually try to uh, uh, justify it by looking at molecular uh, gas distribution in the galaxy, because this molecular gas, it says something about if you have a high gas density, it says something whether you will form stars, and then subsequently whether they will uh, become uh, uh, supernovas. And if you use this uh, information, uh, here you have one uh, example. Uh, this is then the gas distribution uh, in the uh, Milky Way, or an attempt to, uh, to, to, to get it, where you have the solar system here, you have the galactic center, and you have the opposite part here. It's actually very difficult to get uh, the information in this part, uh, but that will be relevant in just a second. But it means that I have two ways of producing something which is related to uh, uh, the star formation, either from the open clusters or from the gas concentration. And when I compare the two, the red curve is from the open stellar uh, clusters, and the solid line is from the gas. And you see, uh, except for this region here where there are some problems, it actually uh, seems to reflect uh, some of the same changes. So this is my justification that uh, maybe it's not completely wrong to say that the cosmic ray history has looked something like this. Okay? So when we have the cosmic ray history, we want to compare it what happened uh, on Earth during uh, this period of time. And this is where geology comes into place. Uh, here you see uh, some sedimentary mountains. Uh, all these uh, uh, layers has to do with ancient uh, seabeds. Uh, and uh, from this you can, from isotopes, carbon-13, uh, oxygen-18, you can get uh, information on the timeline or dating. You can get fossils, so you say something about the evolution. 
you can say something about the sea levels, glaciations, and therefore, of course, also uh, on climate. So you can get a lot of information that you can compare uh, with. And let me, uh, oh, this is just to show you uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the part of time that we are looking at. This is uh, more or less the last 500 million years. And of course, the continents has been moving around uh, like crazy over 500 million years. And, uh, you know, life has moved from uh, the oceans to land, and many things have happened. So therefore, it would be quite remarkable if there was something, you know, common uh, uh, that comes from the outside that actually can explain some of the things that has happened uh, over this period of time. And this is exactly what I want to show you now, uh, that there are these uh, correlations. Now, the first thing is to compare sort of uh, in a crude way with uh, climate. And uh, what I have here is, uh, you know, an attempt to make, a, you know, a bar uh, where uh, the blue is a cold ocean, the red is uh, warm, this hatch is when we have glaciations. And uh, if you look now, you see you, we have glaciations here in this period, then uh, it's fairly low and we don't really have glaciations, we have some periods with some cold. But then we get glaciations again, it fits fairly beautiful with the uh, increase here. Then you see here we have a cold uh, ocean and uh, some glaciations. Then again we have cold ocean, glaciations and uh, so forth. Now this is of course very crude, uh, but we can do it uh, slightly better. Um, then this is actually the work uh, also of uh, Jan Weiser and, uh, and, and his colleagues. Uh, where they use these radiopods as, uh, uh, to say something about the temperature at the time when these animals uh, lived. By looking at the oxygen 18 in these shells, it says something about the temperature of the ocean when it lived. And these animals have been living you know, for a period uh, over uh, more than 500 million years. So you can actually get a curve uh, of uh, temperature over uh, quite a long uh, period. And here I show you 200 million years. Now, the red curve is the change in cosmic rays or the supernova ray. Uh, and all these dots uh, are from these shells. And you see that there are very nice correlations, especially if we go to the more recent part. Here you have the glaciation of Antarctica, then it heated up a little bit, and then it reglaciated again and it fits fairly uh, nicely with these uh, changes. So, uh, another thing uh, I want to mention, uh, because, I mean, when, when I show this figure here, I'm showing you just the level of uh, supernovas over this uh, period, but in reality, supernovas are, of course, uh, more or less discrete events that are happening in time and space in the solar neighborhood. And that means that uh, we will have fluctuations in the cosmic rays. And here you see uh, you know, a, an attempt to make a time series of how, uh, how large the, uh, the fluctuations are. Now, the size of the fluctuations depends on certain parameters, uh, but nonetheless, you will actually expect uh, on these timescales to have a fairly fluctuating uh, system uh, with the uh, cosmic rays. So, what I've been showing you up until this point is sort of average uh, features. Now, if we start looking at uh, sea levels, this is over the last 50 million years, and this blue curve is actually changes in sea level. You see the sea level here, and the changes is actually on the order of uh, 100 meters or, or more. Uh, but you see that there are these spikes in the uh, sea levels uh, as a function of time. And the question is whether, when I uh, show the, the modeling of the cosmic rays over this period, whether this is actually something that could be the cause of these sudden uh, changes uh, in sea level uh, over this period. The red curve is the average change in uh, cosmic rays or uh, uh, supernovas uh, over this uh, period of time. Now I come to the last uh, two graphs. Um, and I want to show you that we have been talking about that there seems to be a correlation with, uh, with climate on these uh, timescales. Now I want to show you that uh, it's not just climate, but it's actually life itself on Earth that seems to be very much uh, affected by uh, the uh, supernovas in the uh, neighborhood. 
uh, of our solar system. Now we know, of course, that uh, the solar energy or the, all the energy for life comes from the sun. So we have a, a life in the uh, in the oceans. We can have a large bioproduction, but in order to get this bioproduction, you have to get nutrients uh, into the oceans. And uh, these nutrients are like uh, you know phosphor or iron or nitrogen. It has to be uh, either blown or river run off, uh, and that sort of supports uh, the the, uh, the life. When life uh, dies, it actually sinks down into the water column, and uh, let me see. Uh, and it's very important, of course, that we have mixing of some kind so we can support uh, a large uh, biomass. But what is important is that. When we support life, it's of course carbon that is the most important uh, part of, uh, uh, I mean, this is the uh, building block uh, of all life. And it turns out that life prefer to take the light form of carbon, uh, that is carbon-12, instead of carbon-13. So if you have a large biomass, then a lot of the carbon-12 is locked into the, uh, into the life into the biomass. And that means that when we have inorganic <coughs> carbon sediments, uh, when we have changes in the biomass, uh, and also, I mean, so you can see it this way, that when you have a change in the biomass, you actually get a change in the carbon searching in the uh, sediments uh, that you can now uh, drill out. So if you take out some of these sediments today and you measure the changes in carbon-13, it says something about what happened with the biological system as a function of time. And here, yeah, now I want to compare the, these two, uh, and I will show you that there is a remarkable uh, correlation. So this is uh, the change in cosmic rays uh, or the supernovas over this period of time. And if I compare with the uh, carbon-13, how that has changed, it looks something like this. And, and you see that, uh, uh, I mean, if I made an average of it, it will actually follow this curve very, very beautifully uh, over this period of time. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's quite remarkable that uh, the correlations uh, are uh, so, uh, so good. So let me uh, conclude. Uh, I mean, we see that uh, variations in cosmic rays seems to be associated with changes in the Earth's climate, and we have very strong empirical evidence. And the evidence also suggests that clouds are very important. Uh, you know, this is, uh, it could actually be the link. Um, the mechanism, which is of course the basic uh, of understanding, uh, you know, why there is these uh, co connections. I think we are making progress, and uh, it involves the ionization and the formation of aerosols in the Earth's atmosphere. And I, I mean, it shouldn't be necessary to say that if you change clouds, then you can change the energy budget uh, of the Earth. And I think that with this. Cosmic ray climate link, uh, I think that it can have very large implications for our understanding of, uh, I mean, not just the history of the Earth, but also the history and the conditions uh, for how life has uh, evolved uh, as a function uh, of time. Thank you very much.